Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin, System Administrator at a public university, and I have with me my good co-host, Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and the Open MPI Project. Jeff, good thanks again. Bob. Hey, Jeff. Uh, I should point out, Jeff, uh, I'm not going to have, we're going to skip a show here. I'm going to be traveling to Terra Grid 09 for a week, and I'm not going to be able to do a recording during that time. So there's going to be a two-week pause here before we have the next show out. But we will be back okay, with another show know. later. Yeah. Good to know. Okay. And our show today is we have Paul Hargrove from the Berkeley Lab Checkpoint Restart Project. It's a checkpointing um, software for the Linux operating system. And maybe it runs on some other stuff, but we'll find out from him. And um, he's at Ber Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. I'll make sure I have that right. Lawrence Berkeley. So, uh, Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you. So, Paul, can you give us a real quick, I, I know BLCR works on Linux, but can you give us a quick rundown of what it is and if it runs on any platforms besides Linux? Sure. Well, the idea of BLCR, Berkeley Lab Checkpoint Restart, is to provide the ability to save the state of HPC applications and restart them again later. And it is really targeted at Linux systems, but I've heard people talk about having some sort of uh, port to uh, some SIGWIN thing that was was developed. I don't have the details on that. It's not something that we're doing directly. As far as I'm concerned, Linux is our target. Okay, so real quick, so I'm familiar with checkpointing, but normally checkpointing is built into the application itself. The application, every so many time steps or so much wall clock, it will save a state to a file. Um, is Berkeley a library that helps with that, or is it like OS-level checkpointing? BLCR is an OS-level checkpointer, and when we started this project, there were at least two major reasons why we were interested, not in replacing, but in augmenting what applications can do on their own. <laughs> and while application-level checkpoint is pretty good for handling uh, fault tolerance or the issues of how long a uh, job can run in a given queue. Uh, there are two things that the NERSC Center, the National Energy Research Supercomputing Center at Berkeley Lab, uh, were using the OS level checkpointing on their Cray system at the time, and we've tried to emulate uh, those ideas. And so the two things that were of interest there were uh, really more system administration oriented things, and that was. Uh, job migration type capabilities, being able to repack the Taurus on a Cray T3E was very important to uh, getting jobs through on that system. And the other thing was similar to that, uh, being able to manage the scheduling of the system in such a way that very long running jobs or very wide full configuration jobs were limited to a certain part of the workday, or actually not the workday, to the uh, midnight to 4 a.m. time slot. So BLCR's original sort of selling points when proposing this work to the Department of Energy was more in the scheduling area and the uh, uh, sort of job throughput uh, system utilization benefits uh, than for the fault tolerance. Now, of course, the fault tolerance is something that Checkpoint Restart uh, is, is good for, but uh, it's something that is harder to, uh, to, to do efficiently. We have the... Uh, you know, the ability to checkpoint at the OS level, uh, but we don't have any application level knowledge. So I should point out real fast that when we say checkpointing, and you mentioned in your restart, it's really the ability to restart an application from some point in time before it's done. It could be saving the state and pick up from any point. So with the OS level checkpointing, you're actually able to kind of save an application mid-run and restart it um, from that point in time without having to start from the beginning. That right, exactly. That migrated somewhere else too, right? I mean, that's that's kind of what Paul just mentioned there, that it, it can be useful. Uh, in Cray's example, they were repacking the Taurus to get better network utilization, assumedly. But say uh, a node is about to go down or you just need to give up uh, some nodes altogether and so kind of pause your application and restart it later. But that that later might be on different nodes in your Linux cluster, for example. Are these all uh, correct examples, Paul? Yes, yes. Actually, while we were originally targeting cluster systems, 
uh, there are a number of grid-related projects that have started using BLCR for migration. So the sort of uh, network of workstations, the uh, uh, volunteer computing grids sort of people have looked at using BLCR for migrating jobs away from machines when they go back to their normal use. So the sort of, you know, this machine is someone's desktop nine to five, but overnight runs, runs someone's engineering or scientific computing job. Uh, they've looked at using BLCR for, for managing those type scenarios where they can migrate it off to another resource that might be available. All right. Now, Paul, you mentioned that this is you have no application level knowledge. What, what, what do you mean by that? So this is uh, assumedly down in the kernel somewhere. And and, um, you know, are you in, in a sense just making a big core dump file that can be restarted later or, you know, how, how does that work? Well, Yes, um, one could think of what's in there as a core file. Uh, in fact, that's actually what we experimented originally with before we had the ability to restart things. We were uh, just dumping core files and examining them with GDB to make sure we were getting the right process. Um, as I said, the application level knowledge, I guess I sort of jumped into the middle of something instead of the beginning or the end. Uh, Brock mentioned that applications typically do checkpoint, and this is often uh, using sort of a minimal representation of what the application needs. Uh, what we're doing is we're dumping the entire memory image of a process. Now, there are some optimizations we're able to make uh, for the executable and shared libraries, for instance. We're storing just the path name to that file, and we're not actually copying the contents. But everything that's in the heap, in the stack, and uh, similarly, anything that relates to an a map of an unlinked file, which is something often done for temporary files, uh, those are all saved in the image. And we don't have the knowledge that this gigabyte of memory was uh, something that was malloced and freed and doesn't mean anything to the application anymore, but the OS still had it in, in the memory map of the, of the application. So in that sense, it is like the core dump and it's capturing all of the, all of the memory. It's also capturing the registers, the uh, signal handler registrations, a number of other things that are stored in kernel data structures that don't exist specifically in some particular region of the application memory, something that the application may be able to query through the, uh, through the OS. But since we're doing things at the OS side of the interface, we're able to get all those things uh, a little more efficiently and a little more thorough in some ways that... Uh, you can't always access things. And this is one of the things that distinguishes BLCR from some of the user level checkpointing libraries that uh, we can get information, for instance, about the files that are open or the files that are unmapped uh, without needing to dive into the proc file system and without needing to do uh, tricks like interposing or wrapping parts of libc to track the open and close calls. Tricks like that are not necessary because we're working on the kernel side of things. So there's the, the trade-off between being able to uh, capture the information efficiently and accurately versus having to capture all of it without discriminating what was really essentially necessary to the application or not. Cool. So uh, since you're down in the kernel, are, are you part of you know, Linus's kernel? Are you part of you know, Red Hat or any other distro or, or how do you distribute the VLCR software? So there are a couple parts to that, that question there. Um, are we in any distros? Uh, we're working on that. Are we part of the uh, Linus Torvalds kernel? The answer there is definitely a no. Um, the decision going from the very beginning was that we were going to write VLCR as a kernel module and not require any patches to the kernel. Uh, that means there haven't been any patches to submit upstream for inclusion, for one thing. Uh, but that choice was made because looking at our target audience of these HPC centers, especially ones that are funded by DOE, often you're buying from an integrator or a vendor that just won't support your system if you're patching the kernel they provide. And so by having a loadable kernel module, a given center can just not load the module at startup or unload the module after that and you know, make their service call for whatever may be wrong, and the vendor uh, you know, will still support the system. Whereas a patched, custom-compiled kernel, uh, it's a matter of they would have to reboot the system back to the vendor's kernel to get support. So we've stuck with a, a patch-free approach, and um, the result is that there hasn't been any sort of active uh, 
and there's nothing, nothing to uh, feed back to the uh, to the Linus Torvalds kernel. Um, as far as the distro thing goes, though, uh, well, we're not officially part of any particular distribution. Uh, we have a few users out there that are pushing for uh, inclusion in some of these uh, package download sites. So the RPM Fusion site that is used with the Fedora systems has for Fedora 10 a BLCR package that one of the users packages up. So one can just use the standard tools there to easily install BLCR. So because it's a kernel module, the administrator at a site needs to actually install it, so it's not a library. So if a user has an application, they want to use BLCR, they have to convince their administrator at their site to actually install um, the kernel side of it to actually have it be available. What are some of the other limitations out there? You mentioned that you um, don't actually package up all the dynamic libraries, all the SO files, and you just include paths to them. What if I try to resume that checkpoint on a machine where the libraries may be in a different location? Will it fail or will it work? Um, well, yes or no. <laughs> uh, as I said, uh, we do have some interests, some users in the grid community that uh, were not part of our original target audience, certainly not part of what we proposed to the Department of Energy when we started the project. Uh, but at their urging and, and to satisfy some of their needs, we do now have the option of actually saving the executable and shared libraries. It greatly increases the size of the image that's saved, uh, but it does allow us to optionally get around the issue you just raised, and that is that if the shared libraries are not the same or not available on the target system in a migration or not available on a system uh, even if it's the same system after it's been shut down for maintenance. So let's say you, you've taken a checkpoint of the system, brought the system down, upgraded from you know one distro to its its next uh, version, and glibc was updated as a result. Uh, we wouldn't be able to restart normally in that circumstance. But if when you took the checkpoint, uh, you being a good system administrator and having realized that you were upgrading glibc, uh, gave BLCR the option to for that particular set of checkpoints anyway. Uh, do the extra I.O. And, and save the shared libraries. That's that's a limitation that we uh, still have by default, but there's a way to get around that one. Uh, other limitations, uh, since you go there, uh, BLCR really is targeted at HPC. And as a result, we realize that um, MPI is an absolute must. You have to be able to checkpoint more than just a serial process. Yet we don't have the resources ourselves in our group to implement the necessary integration for all the potential high-speed networks, all the potential MPIs. So uh, we sort of punted on that, you could say. Uh, instead of having checkpointing of any sort of network I.O., no sockets, no uh, InfiniBand, uh, BLCR just has a callback mechanism, and the MPI implementers are st stuck working with that. Um, we can deal with that laundry list later. The MPI implementations have done pretty well on that. Um, but because BLCR isn't natively handling network communication, if someone has an application that's using something other than MPI for communication, BLCR won't be able to handle that. We've recently had someone who, for I guess, sounded like it was a class project type thing, uh, wanted to play around with checkpointing of Apache, and we just had to tell them, well, we can't deal with TCP sockets. You're not likely to get what you want out of that. We've had people ask questions about uh, they wanted to checkpoint an application that was connected to a MySQL server, and we told them similarly there that uh, you know, we won't be able to handle the socket connection to that, and most likely we won't be able to do anything useful with the, uh, the, the data in the, in the SQL. So we had to tell them that they weren't likely to be able to do much with that. So there are a lot of sort of non-HBC circumstances. People out there have client server applications we can't do much for. So you're really concentrating mostly on the, you know, the compute and the memory and, and those kind of resources and, and not so much the, the network resources. Is that a, a fair characterization? Yes, we're doing the part that we're able to do efficiently, we're able to do effectively. We're sort of specializing on, on you know, those types of things, the stuff that the, that the kernel manages in a, uh, a, a almost passed through way. The networking, uh, doing checkpointing with TCP stack is a research area in itself. 
uh, trying to track the drivers for, you know, uh, Quadrix, Mirrornet, uh, Infiniband, all those high-speed network things, um, not something that we were uh, able to, to think about doing in a fully generic way. Uh, if it's done in an MPI runtime, it needs to integrate at the level of that implementation and not be fully generic. And so uh, it seems much more effective in terms of hours of, of human work that go into it to provide a callback mechanism. And so BLCR has this way to register uh, in the user space side of things. So in, in libmpi, uh, a callback, and that's similar to a signal handler. It's invoked when the checkpoint is requested and allows MPI to save its state, enough information to reestablish connections, for instance, make sure it's not losing any messages or has the ability to replay them if it's willing to lose them, and uh, you know whatever other bookkeeping may be necessary for that particular implementation. Well, that certainly seems fair because there's certain. I mean, some of those networks that you named too are are also OS bypass, so the OS. And, and therefore, you as a kernel module don't even have access to the state. The only state that is visible is going to be known to the MPI. And so, uh, you know, I, since I obviously represent OpenMPI here, we've done a lot of that integration work. Actually, 99% of that work has been done by Josh Hersey from Indiana University. He's done a really great job. Um, but, yeah, so I, you know, it seems like a perfectly logical and, and reasonable uh, division of labor there and division of state knowledge that, uh, you know, a higher level runtime that's – that's extending, for example, even the, you know, the single process concept to be a multi-process job, you know, that guy's got to be the one that uh, coordinates the network checkpointing side of things. I, you know, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, but what, what other things – actually, I'm sorry. I want to take a step back here and, and let's take the parallel bit out of it here and just explain a little bit more. So what you've provided in BLCR is actually a just completely – transparent let let's say it was just a, a plain vanilla serial job it, it can be as simple as a plain vanilla your job was running and then all of a sudden it's you know paused into a, a checkpoint file or something like that and then um you know 20 hours later for whatever you know the system administrator took it down and then 20 hours later the system administrator put it back up and that job had no clue that it even happened it was you know there's no extra code in that job at all, right? And is that a correct example? Is that the, the level of transparency that you were going for there? You've got it 99% correct. So there is no modification made by the user to their source code. So it's transparent at the application level. Uh, just as when you move from one MPI to another, you may be required to recompile or relink. Uh, there's a little, you know, a little gotcha there. So we do require a small amount of code to be linked into the application. And when we're working with an integration with an MPI, that's actually sort of hidden down in the MPI CC wrapper uh, links in our library, and it needs to because it's calling into that library itself to manage the, the callbacks. But we also have the ability to use the LD preload environment variable. So if you did have that truly unmodified example being all those programs in bin and user bin, uh, we can use LD preload to insert our small amount of code at runtime into those applications. So that brings up another weakness. We do not have that capability if you have a statically linked application. So static is not a very common case, uh, but it is one that we, we do have to work around uh, telling people not to Documenting that uh, linking statically is not going to going to work out. So so far, we've actually mentioned like system administrators check, um, starting a checkpoint. If if I'm just a home user and I've got this on my box where I'm developing stuff and I want to use it, how do I actually tell BLCR I want to take a checkpoint now? Well, um, it's actually just just basically we have three commands in in the. Uh, release of, of BLCR around which uh, various schedulers, batch schedulers can integrate things. Uh, but if we're not doing the batch system, then there are basically three commands. CR underscore run is provided to handle that LD preload thing. So let's say I wanted to start um, a bash shell and I was going to checkpoint that. And so I was going to have a, 
uh, sort of interactive session. I was going to checkpoint that and restart it later. Let's say that uh, you know Hibernate and Suspend doesn't work on my laptop. Uh, I could actually do uh, CR underscore run space bash space dash login and have a or well yeah I guess that's a reasonable example. Uh, I could just be running stuff in that normally. And then I could take a checkpoint of that with a command CR underscore checkpoint, and then there are a bunch of arguments that are really not worth trying to uh, describe out loud. Uh, and that would create a file that would be usable at a later time to restart from. The bash session would happen to continue, and you could do a bunch, a bunch of work there, and uh, let's say your battery suddenly fails. Uh, when you get back to AC power later, you could CR underscore restart, and give as an argument the file that was created when you did CR underscore checkpoint. And it really is as simple as that. Um, and the example of bash is not a made up one. That's something we actually have done. Uh, we have a, a test suite. A lot of the sort of corner case tests actually are, are you know, really messy C code. But for a lot of very simple things, we actually just have bash scripts that do various things that we checkpoint and restart to test some of the easy functionality. So if you checkpoint bash and bash is running something else, BLCR will also checkpoint all the children of that process. It will automatically do all that. I guess it makes sense. It would kind of need to, but it will yes. actually do that. So earlier versions of BLCR, that was the biggest limiting factor. I would say more so than the inability to handle communication or static libraries was that it was originally only able to handle a single process. Uh, could have been multi-threaded with p-threads, but it had to be a single process. But for uh, a few years now, we've had the ability to handle just, uh, you know, uh, not arbitrary sets yet, but handle a process and all of its immediate descendants. So, you know, children, grandchildren, etc. Uh, if a program tried to what we call demonize, where uh, a process starts a process that exits after starting a third process, then we've lost the connection between that parent and, or sorry, I guess that process and its grandchild. Uh, we'd miss that. But we have the ability to handle uh, POSIX uh, session IDs and process group IDs. And in that way, we don't actually depend on, on the, uh, the parentage. So uh, both process trees and groups we're able to handle and, and get the, the children of, uh, of the bash. And so, um, actually, I guess you've, you've reached another one of my limitations. Uh, the terminal handling that a full screen editor like VI or Emacs uh, does, we're not able to checkpoint and restart that correctly. So if you were running Emacs at the time you took the checkpoint, then when you restarted uh, the display modes or the, uh, the uh, what is it called? Uh, the, the terminal settings would not necessarily be correct, and so you'd probably have to exit, you know, save your file in Emacs and, and restart it to get your screen to you know, not look all garbagey. But uh, again, not exactly a huge HPC limiting factor there. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like BLCR is not something that's going to change how you edit source files, um, but it can be definitely helpful when whatever you were editing is running for 48 hours and the hardware looks like it's going to die 24 hours into it. Right. And I should say a lot of these limitations that BLCR currently has are not huge technical limitations. They're more a matter of we have finite time, finite resources, and we prioritize things that we saw as being HPC critical first and then stuff that uh, is HPC useful a second and stuff that's HPC not relevant uh, just hasn't been addressed, and uh, uh, someday, you know, maybe some user will contribute the uh, stuff necessary to deal with things like the terminal settings or uh, you know other things that we haven't haven't covered. Uh, there are, is some online documentation describing what sort of the priority list was at some point. I think it's still reasonably correct. The only thing that's probably out of date is the list of which things we have gotten to is probably incomplete. Is there a way to tell CR run to automatically dump a checkpoint every 15 minutes a wall clock? Is there any way to do that, or is that pretty much the responsibility of writing like a third script called from cron? So at this point, we don't provide anything that manages periodic checkpoints automatically. As I said, those three 
executables, uh, they're really meant as sort of the base, the building blocks for building up other types of scripts. If you're dealing with a batch system, for instance, it would be more sensible or more appropriate to instruct the batch system to be responsible for the checkpointing, since it usually has some requirements for where the checkpoint files have to be for restart. It's the logical agent to do that. But yes, if you wanted to have your, let's stick with the bash session, if you wanted to have your bash checkpointed every 15 minutes, you could write your you know, cron or at or whatever, or you could just have a little background uh, shell script that uh, slept for 15 minutes and then invoked a checkpoint, and, you know, while one or whatever. Okay, so what resource managers do you know of actually integrate with BLCR? Like, if someone wanted to run it, make, see if the resource manager supported it, um, what what's some of the more so, popular ones that actually support it? So one of the challenging things about working with open source software is that people can do, do whatever they want with your software. They don't always have to tell you about it. So my list is probably incomplete at this point. Uh, the one that we're aware of and have actually worked productively with is uh, the Torque resource manager. Uh, so Torque being in the PBS family, uh, someone else could probably take their work, their patches, and uh, port it to open PBS. And we have... Uh, talked with Altair Engineering about getting this into PBS Pro, and uh, so I would speculate that uh, PBS Pro will have this functionality at some point in the future if they haven't already. Uh, we have been contacted by Platform Computing about LSF. Uh, they only really asked licensing questions and uh, haven't asked any technical questions, so I would assume that they have looked at doing this, but I can't even guess whether they're doing it or not. Um, the uh, other uh, major one that I can think of right now is uh, is Grid Engine, and uh, there is some work that's been done that is available if you just Google for it. Uh, instructions for how to set up BLCR uh, with Grid Engine, but I don't believe it would necessarily be a, a complete integration. I haven't haven't tried that one myself. So speaking of which, and, and, and based on your uh, organization where you work, I can kind of guess, but let's make it make sure for, for real here. Uh, what, what is the license of BLCR? Uh, BLCR is completely open source license as, a, as is required for the money we receive from the Department of Energy. Uh, but the different pieces actually are subject to different licenses, partly just based on uh, where code is derived from. So we contain a great deal of code in the kernel, in the Linux kernel, and that is um, as appropriate and pretty much by necessity uh, GPL licensed. Uh, we do have, as has been mentioned, the BLCR library that, for instance, the MPI calls into to handle its uh, callbacks, as well as the small version of the library, the stub, we call it, that one LD preloads. Those are under the LGPL license to allow those to be used without conflict with, with any application, regardless of what its licensing may be. And then the um, other user space pieces are, uh, well, gee, I can't remember if we ended up putting some of those under the BSD or not. I know we had this question with our own licensing people. So there you go. I can't answer that qu question accurately. I believe that we put <laughs> the, uh, I believe we attempted to put the user space pieces. They're not all that big. Uh, it was the smallest part of the whole thing. I believe we tried to put those under a BSD style license so that people could uh, rip those up and do anything they wanted with them. So I'll stick with that as my final answer. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm glad to know we stumped the interviewee. So that's 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 always a goal here. <laughs> Okay, so Paul, while we're talking here about integration with BL with other pieces of software, let's talk about with MPI. So I already mentioned that uh, BLCR is integrated with OpenMPI. Which which other MPIs is BLCR integrated with? Well, the first MPI we were integrated with is LAM MPI, but that no longer really counts as an active MPI project. But in addition to OpenMPI, we are integrated with Envapitch 2 from Ohio State, DK Panda's group, uh, that being a very popular MPI for InfiniBand networks. Uh, we have had discussions with the group at Argonne for MPitch2, and they now have some funding from the same project that funds BLCR uh, that will get that work eventually done. Uh, we've also had discussions with a few other groups. Uh, as I mentioned before, Platform Computing contacted us about the 
uh, LSF batch schedule, but they've also discussed uh, integration with their MPI. And we've had discussions with Intel about integration with their MPI. So didn't you guys have an announcement recently where you had gotten BLCR hooked in onto Crate XT platform? Oh, yes, platform? I'm sorry. That was probably the most important for me anyway answer to that previous question. Cray did the work to integrate their MPitch 2 based Cray portals MPI with BLCR and they also funded in part the work I mentioned earlier on Torque. Uh, so using I guess it's the P 2.2 or 2.3 system software release from Cray, uh, one is able to use BLCR to checkpoint and restart through their batch system and through their app run job launcher, uh, MPI applications on a Cray XT. Did they have a lot of trouble um, with their, does this only work on Compute Node Linux or does it work on Unicos too? Uh, it's a Compute Node Linux. Compute Node Linux? Or I guess okay. they prefer just calling it CNL at this point. When administrators are setting up their resource managers to use BLCR, what's the common way you see it used? Do they checkpoint every certain amount of time to prevent against hardware failure or do you see more often the checkpoint for preemption suspension chain you know um hardware change well again we've gotten back to the uh weak point of working in an open source project is that people don't tell you what they're doing with your software so uh certainly the torque system has inherited from the original PBS work, uh, command line options for specifying periodic checkpoints. And so that's something that's available automatically as a command line option at job submission or as a part of a PBS script. But I'm not aware that systems are set up autonomously to do periodic checkpointing of all jobs uh, on a regular basis. So uh, don't really have a good answer for what is a typical setup because I'm not even completely sure of what uh, what people are capable of scripting on their own. Uh, but uh, again, our focus in doing this wasn't originally the fault tolerance work, so we haven't ourselves provided how-tos or scripts or, or tools for getting all of that stuff done. So again, um, I don't know what, what is a typical deployment out there. Yeah, actually, we've we've heard that many times on this show that people aren't exactly sure what people are using. So on that same note then, of the uses you do know, what's the most unusual case? You already mentioned checkpointing your login shell. Um, what's some of the strangest stuff you never thought you would see BLCR actually doing? Let's see. How do I do this without actually naming the... Well, I'll start with one of the... T there are two unusual uses that I've heard of that were definitely not part of our original expectation. Uh, one is that we've had users from both the Australian and United States Defense Departments. And they're actually using BLCR to take checkpoints of uh, battlefield simulation software. So these are sort of deterministic event-driven simulations used in uh, you know, uh, warfare planning. And they're using BLCR to checkpoint those. And I guess it's both fault tolerance as well as something that's sometimes called branch points, the ability to take this application, which is just another simulation, uh, not unlike HPC, except I don't believe they're parallel, uh, to be able to checkpoint that and then restart, in their case, multiple instances. That's why they're calling it a branch point uh, with different inputs. So the scenario in the warfare may say you cross the river at this point or you don't, and they want to see what both those options look like. So they start two instances, one running down the you cross the river choice and one that you didn't. Uh, so that's a sort of a scenario we never really thought of when when starting the work on BLCR. Uh, so the other one is – go ahead. Uh, so they actually took the checkpoint and they've basically restarted it twice. Yes. <laughs> that's funny. I never even thought about that. Yeah, well, as a debugging thing, um, it just sort of actually makes sense. It's also a computational steering application if you want to think about that. An application that itself wasn't designed to do any sort of steering. Now you have the ability to – stop it at some point, potentially modify an input file or provide a, a piece of next input if it was going to, to prompt or wait for, for input. So to continue with my, my answer, the other thing that we were approached about, and I do not know if it was a completed project, uh, there was a 
cash register manufacturer, I won't use their name, uh, that was interested in using BLCR as a way to checkpoint and restart the sort of uh, inventory application, the inventory control application that was running in Linux, apparently, uh, in one of their cash registers. Uh, I guess they didn't have any sort of suspend to disk or hibernate type functionality, and they were looking at using uh, BLCR when it shut down to save the state of this software. And uh, we inquired why they weren't just modifying the software to save its state to some sort of database. Um, and their response was that the application, the accounting nature of the application was certified by some authority, and they weren't permitted to modify that without needing to resubmit it for some certification. And they decided oh, that, that to using BLCR and checkpointing it, apparently they believe didn't require recertification. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if they actually followed through with that. Uh, my guess would be that they probably would need new certification for something <laughs> if they did that. But that wasn't their thought. Uh, in a in a slightly different uh, line of questioning here, we we didn't we kind of missed this one when we went by it before. What what kind of determines the size of the the checkpoint file that it is created, and and what do people typically do with that, or at least you know among among your uses of BLCR, what do you see users doing with that? Because it's my understanding that this file can actually be pretty large, and if you're doing it with a large MPI job, you could have dozens or hundreds of processes running, all dumping out these large files. What are, what are some scenarios and, and how do people handle that? Well, I may not be able to answer the how do they handle it, but um, I can certainly answer the first part, uh, how large are these files? And so as I mentioned before, we basically save all the memory. So if you're going to do PS or top and you look at the uh, RSS column, resident set size, that's often a very good first order approximation to what our checkpoint size is going to be for a given process. And then you multiply that by the number of MPI ranks and you've got a fairly large I.O. problem to deal with uh, for any sizable MPI job. Uh, this is something that I know is a big issue on something like a Cray uh, where you know, the amount of total memory in the system may be very large and the time to checkpoint that may actually be on the order of an hour, time to actually do I.O. for the entire memory of a uh, Cray system to disk, maybe on that order. Uh, how do people deal with this? Um, probably not very well. This is a fundamental issue with doing system level checkpointing, that the I.O. required is significantly larger in most cases than what an application level checkpoint would do. We are trying to address this in a couple different ways, so I'm glad you asked the question. I get to give some plug for our current work. Uh, there are at least three things that we know can be done to try to address that. Uh, one of them, perhaps the most obvious, is compression. And uh, one could try you know, piping BLCR's output to uh, gzip or bzip2 or whatever. Uh, we're actually taking an approach now of doing that same sort of thing, but at a kernel level, so you're not talking about an extra process with a bunch of extra context switches and copies back and forth between kernel space and user space. Uh, but the compression can only be so efficient. We do have to use lossless compression. So uh, the compressibility of someone's application is going to depend a great deal on what sort of data their, their memory contains. So there's no reliable factor I can quote for what compression can achieve. Uh, the second one that people are probably familiar with or may think of is what's called incremental checkpointing. And the idea there is that if we take a checkpoint and do all that I.O., and then an hour later or two hours later we go to take a checkpoint, the application may not have actually written all of its memory pages since that previous checkpoint. So the idea of incremental checkpointing is at that second or any subsequent checkpoints, don't do the I.O. to write out duplicates of pages that have been unchanged since a previous checkpoint. In addition to those two approaches, we've started working on something, uh, the ability for an application to give hints. An application, from my point of view, also includes the MPI library. It's something in, in user space, I guess. Uh, the ability to give hints to say that this region of memory does not need to be checkpointed if you take a checkpoint. Uh, this is something that 
I've talked to Josh Hersey about in the Open MPI case, there are receive buffers that are known to be unused, not to contain any useful data at the time the checkpoint is taken. And since BLCR and OpenMPI are already sort of having a dialogue through the library interface, uh, OpenMPI can conveniently tell BLCR about these sections of memory that don't need to be included in the checkpoint. The potential exists for numerical libraries or even applications to use the similar interface when it becomes available to sort of advertise work arrays or scratch arrays that may consume a lot of memory but not have any useful data. And finally, we may actually be able with this to approach the efficiency of an application level checkpoint if the application wants to write to this interface instead of their own application level checkpointing. They could compose their data down into sort of the fundamental pieces and exclude the pieces that can be reproduced, recalculated, for instance, from that fundamental data, which is what is usually sort of the, uh, the gist of how they do their application checkpointing is, you know, separating out the parts that are reproducible from those that aren't. Mm, that's very cool, actually. I'll, I'll be very interested to see when, when this stuff comes out, and uh, I'll probably be a fly on the wall in some of your conversations with Josh. Um, let me ask you, since we're talking about future stuff, what, what else is up and coming from BLCR? What, what do you see as the future? So I can talk a little bit about things that uh, I know are likely to come in the next 6, 12 months. The, the things that I just discussed are all hoped to be present in our late October, early November release. We always try to get one out in time for supercomputing. Uh, so we expect to see the incremental, if we're lucky, uh, the compression definitely, the memory exclusion almost definitely. Uh, another feature that I'm working on right now is actually based on some work that was done uh, by uh, a uh, student at North Carolina State University in conjunction with some folks at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, that is a, it was done actually with LAM and a very old version of BLCR, so LAM's not completely dead apparently. <laughs> um, they called it a job pause mechanism, but the and you can go Google on that for uh, for the papers. That's one of the reasons I didn't give the names because I'd probably miss one out. Uh, the a fundamental change they made in BLCR for that particular paper was the ability to take an application process that is running and without it exiting, direct it to reload its memory, its registers, its signal handlers, its file handles, all that from a previous checkpoint. So that, to me, is rollback in place. So uh, that is something we are working on reintegrating, updating from its uh, from the old version of BLCR it was written to, and uh, getting that uh, in with standard calling conventions and such so that we could actually take a process that is currently running and force it to, you know, time warp backwards and uh, start back from a checkpoint that was taken. So one of my simple examples I use for testing is a program that just sits there. It says, it, you know, it prints one, it does sleep one, then it prints two, and then it sleeps one. And print, so it's just counting. And so if I were checkpointing that, I might see it go one, two, three, I take a checkpoint, it keeps going four, five, six. Then I say roll back, and it would just pick up again back at the, the three, four, five. And cool. so uh, this was something that they were using in this original paper uh, to deal with rolling back the non-failed processes in an MPI job. So with what was originally done in LAM and what's currently also done in OpenMPI and most of the others, the approach at failure is that you have to have the entire MPI job fail and exit, and then you restart and you go back and create all these processes again from scratch. And so what they were looking at was improving the efficiency of the restart by having just the one failed process exit and restart and having the other N minus one do this in place rollback and not have to exit. This is also helpful when dealing with the batch scheduler that tends now, most of them want to kill your entire job if one process exits. You can get around that one process problem and continue to use the others without them uh, you know, being destroyed by the, the job scheduler. 
uh, then you can use, continue to use your existing reservation rather than going back to the beginning of the of the or back to the end rather of the queues. We would really like that because about a third of our cycles is provided by some sort of preemption setup. And for the parallel jobs, if we just need one of the CPUs for that 32 CPU job, we call off the whole thing. It'd be nice if we could kind of give them just a another CPU if that's available and restart that. It's not necessarily a failed one, but we kind of need to move just that one. And we don't have to do all that crazy disk I.O. and everything else. We can just do from the last checkpoint for that one process we move someplace else. Right, and that's actually the sort of stuff that BLCR is, is meant to be good at. And so uh, with BLCR, in the particular scenario you've described, you wouldn't necessarily have to go back to the last checkpoint. If you need to do it now, then do it now. Take a checkpoint right this instant at the time you make the scheduling decision that you want to preempt that one application node. You would take a checkpoint of it and uh, BLCR checkpoints to any file descriptor doesn't have to be to disk even. So with a little bit of middleware that I don't have, uh, one could conceivably have this preemption take a checkpoint of that one process to a socket that crossed the network to the new node and restart the process there without ever having to hit the disk. Oh, and which would be this, nice because the disk is slow and it'd be two trips across the network. Right. And then with this in-place rollback, you would direct the other N-1 tasks in the MPI to roll back uh, to um, – sorry, they wouldn't have to roll back. You wouldn't need to do any rollback for those with – with the ability to you know do uh, do this you know, on demand, the checkpointing because BLCR is in the kernel, it is preemptive by its nature. It doesn't have to wait for uh, you know a periodic checkpoint to to roll around. So for preemption type things, uh, BLCR may have a an advantage there over what application checkpointing currently uh, is usually designed to do. Uh, so I know some of them. You can send SIG user one, and it'll take a checkpoint at the end of this current solve or whatever. But those solves may take a significant amount of time, so it's not really all that preemptive in most application level checkpoints. Yeah, I would really like to see that. That would be, I would love to get my hands on that as soon as it's available. Yeah, well, a lot of this is sort of the missing pieces out there, the integration, the the middleware bits. Uh, we need people out there who are interested enough in seeing these applications, these, these uses of BLCR, uh, to help with some of that development and some of that testing, because those are not things that uh, we have the resources or the funding to, to pursue all those, you know, applying BLCR to this circumstance or that circumstance. Okay, so how is the uh, project actually run currently? So how is it run? So uh, BLCR is one of several projects that are funded by the U.S. Department of Energy through a parent project called SIFS, which is an acronym for Coordinated Infrastructure for Fault Tolerance and Systems. Again, uh, Google for it, you'll find it. Uh, it's a multi-institution project that is uh, coordinated through Argonne National Lab. It includes us at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. It includes... Uh, Indiana University, Ohio State, uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, um, uh, and University of Tennessee, Knoxville. I believe I caught everybody. Uh, and a lot of the university stuff on those is for MPI work. Uh, I did say previously that there is money going to Argonne for MPH2 BLCR integration. That's part of what their participation is. So um, that's our source of, of funding and our, our collaborators, and it's a uh, DOE interest in uh, the fault tolerance side of things as, as well as the stuff that uh, BRCR can do beyond that, the, the preemption, the migration, things like that. Okay. So, Paul, I have to ask this to everybody since I'm an open source developer guy myself. What do you guys use for uh, version control? <laughs> We're still in the ancient days of CVS at this point, mainly because, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> mainly because it works for our small group. Usually we only have uh, two or three people at LBL who work on the project and maybe one or two students for a, a summer or sometimes a longer period of time. And uh, with so few people, it's not 
been worth our time to investigate and spend the time to to make a change. But we recognize that, you know, this is just beyond the point of clay tablets. You know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're in the we're in the Stone Age and we know it. But um, part of that is also that uh, we do not have a publicly accessible CVS. Um, to, to keep the lawyers happy, we have a strong definition of what release means and allowing people access to an open source or sorry, an open uh, source or revision control repository uh, makes the idea of release sort of fuzzy. Is every checkout a release? Yeah, yeah. But I'm happy to drop snapshots and things like that for people if there's a, you know, a team out there that wants to do some development and needs to see what the, what the latest looks like. So, website, mailing list? Uh, um, again, Google is your friend. I think if you enter BLCR, you'll probably find it all, but I'll go ahead and, and rattle off the, the URL. Uh, <laughs> HTTP colon slash slash FTG dot LBL dot GOV slash checkpoint, all one word. And that's actually a redirect to the longer URL that I don't try to give out. <laughs> And uh, there's just like a mailing list and some other places where they can ask questions, documentation, download the current release. Yeah, it's all, all there. All those things should be available. All those things should be from that website. But if someone just wants the email address, that's checkpoint at lbl.gov. Okay. And if someone does want to actually hack away on the code, uh, should they contact you on the mailing list about getting a snapshot or should they actually work with the current release? Um. Well, they should definitely contact me on the mailing list because I'd like to know just from my own curiosity what they're working on, um, but also and to coordinate let them with you know if, and coordinate and let them know if someone else has already told me they're working on the same thing, maybe let them coordinate with each other. Um, but uh, in general, it's usually safe to develop stuff with the release CVS version. Uh, I mean, with the released version, sorry, uh, as I try to keep, I'm, I'm pretty good at merging stuff together. The CVS tends to be uh, quite orderly as the result of having so few people working in it. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Paul. This was, uh, this was a good time, and definitely I liked hearing about this. It's something a number of us should probably be using more often and get more value of our existing equipment. Um, this show will be up on www.rce-cast.com. You can subscribe to the podcast in there. You get a feed. We do a show every two weeks. Um, But we will be skipping one this next week as some of us will be gone. So thanks a lot for taking some time out, and we'll have another show in the future. All right. Thanks, Paul. And thank you both for your interest. (laughs) No problem. Thanks a lot.